Well, church, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like to invite you to open up to the book of Acts and join me there in Acts chapter 1. Uh, if you do not own a Bible, we've got some white and gray Bibles out in the lobby. F please feel free to pick one of those up. That is our free gift to you. Take that home, write in it, highlight in it, uh, carry that with you. If you have a Bible, but you left it on the coffee table, there's some red church Bibles underneath the seat near you. Don't write in those. Don't highlight in those. But if you're using one of those, we're going to be on page 966. And then if you're fancy and using an electronic device, all our verses this morning can be found in the YouVersion Bible app. Uh, this morning we're starting a new series in the book of Acts called Seeds of the Church. Uh, we just finished a study through 1 Timothy called Be the Church, as we looked at how to function as a church and, and all the instructions that Paul gave to Timothy there. And now we're going to go back in time and look at the foundations, or really the early beginnings of the church through this series called Seeds of the Church. Uh, this study through Acts is actually part of a three-part sermon series that we're doing here at Redeeming Life through the entire book of Acts. If you were with us at the beginning of this year, then you saw When the Gospel Goes, that series that took us through Acts 13 through 20, kind of the middle of the letter. Now we're going back to the beginning of Acts, looking at Acts chapters 1 through 12. And then, Lord willing, next year we'll be looking at the remainder of Acts, probably in the fall, as we see the gospel on trial. That being said, depending on who you went up to and asked today, you might get a different question. But if you were to go, maybe it's your first time here with us today, and you went up to somebody in the church and you said, how old is your church? You'd probably get a different answer depending on who you asked. Somebody might say, well, our church is four years old, and they'd be right. Or, or they might say, our church is actually about a 10 years old, about a decade old, and they would be right. And then a select few in here might say, actually, our church is 60 years old. I, I, I remember, it's 60 years old. And then at least two or three people who I'm thinking of right now would say, actually, our church is 2,000 years old. <laughs> That's because we see the beginning of the church here in Acts. It's actually since Christ's ascension to heaven that the church has served as God's vehicle for really advancing the gospel, both across the globe and across centuries to the end of the earth. The main point I want you to see, I'm just going to let it out here early. The main point I want you to see from our study today is that Christ builds his church through the faithful witness of his followers. Christ builds his church through the faithful witnesses of his followers. So with that in mind, let's turn our attention to God's word now. Let's look at these first 11 verses here in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, verse 1 says, I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which, he said, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days." So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up and as they were watching and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven. And suddenly, two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I, I thank you for this book of Acts that walks us through things that actually happened, real places, real time, real events in history. Dear Lord, I pray that you would just fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit this morning. Speak to us today. Open our minds and ears to hear your voice. And may we leave here changed because of the power of the gospel. What we know not, Lord, I pray that you would teach us. What we see not, Lord, I pray that you would show us. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. We give you honor and glory and praise your blessed name. Amen. All right. 
So here in Acts chapter 1, we see the story of God's kingdom continues. Acts is actually the second book or the second volume written by Luke. Here in the opening verses of Acts, we see from these first few verses here in chapter 1 that this book opens with a story that is already happening. It's already taking place. In the opening verses of Acts 1, we see the story of God's kingdom has not ended with Christ's resurrection, but rather the gospel story continues even after Christ has ascended back into heaven. The book of Acts serves as a sequel, if you will, to Luke's gospel. Luke begins his second book by recapping where he left off in his gospel account of Jesus Christ and his earthly ministry. It's a lot like Back to the Future 2. Remember Back to the Future 2? If you grew up in the 80s, these were the best movies. Back to the Future 1 ends with everything being right in the world. Marty's with his girlfriend, and Doc takes off in the DeLorean. But then Back to the Future 2, which turns 35 years this year, can you believe it? <laughs> Doc comes back immediately where he left Marty and says, Marty, we got to go to the future. And he says, what's wrong? He's like, it's your kids, Marty. Something has to be done about your kids. Except for here, Luke is saying it's about the gospel. Something has to be done about the gospel, Theophilus. The book of Acts picks up where the gospel of Luke ends. In the ending of Luke, we see a similar scene depicted here as the opening scene in the book of Acts. In, just in Luke chapter 24, starting in the 44th verse, Luke says, with Jesus talking, Jesus told them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead the third day. And repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You, verse 48 says, are witnesses of these things. And look, I am sending you what the Father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. Then he led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. After worshiping him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple, praising God. Sound familiar? Here in the opening of Acts, we see that the story of Christ's kingdom continues. Over these next 13 weeks, we're going to sit back and we're going to watch as Christ builds his church. We get to experience the same emotions of excitement, of fear, and amazement as the disciples did when we follow them along on their mission to advance the gospel to the ends of the earth before Christ returns. The book of Acts is an incredible and fascinating historical book that covers the first 30 years of the church. This book outlines the various miraculous and unbelievable ways that Christ builds his church in the face of some serious opposition and conflict. Christ does this through the obedience of his faithful followers. I cannot tell you how excited I am for the, the Seeds of the Church series as we get to read about the foundations of Christ's church and his mission to advance the gospel here on earth. So that being said, before we dive in, before we unpack these opening verses here in Acts, let's take a moment. Let, let's answer some questions about who our various characters in this story are. You might be asking yourself this morning, who is Theophilus? Who is Luke? Who are these mysterious men in white? Who's Jesus? And who are his disciples? Well, let's talk about these. Theophilus was a pretty ordinary Greek name. It'd be like the name Oleg in Ukraine or the name John here in America. It was the word Theophilus, Theo, meaning God, and Philus, meaning love, that really translate to lover of God or, or friend of God. So there are some Bible scholars that think this person didn't exist. It was just a, a general term for those who are seeking God and, and wanting to know more about him, maybe a Christian seeker. But in the book of Luke, Luke refers to Theophilus as most excellent Theophilus, which leads Bible scholars to believe he was actually a Roman official. Most excellent, most honorable Theophilus. I, I get called that when I go to Taco Bell. They say, oh, most honorable, most excellent taco lover. <laughs> but here, this is a lover of God. He was a young believer and probably financially helped support Luke's ministry. Luke, on the other hand, was a doctor. He, he was well-educated. He was probably wealthy. He was very loyal to Paul, following him along all the time, especially when he was in prison. 
which probably made the fact that he was a doctor very helpful, considering Paul got beat up all the time. He was a prolific writer, and he accompanied Paul on these journeys and, and really interviewed key characters and key people who had roles in Christ's life. Think more Indiana Jones than history, history professor. Luke has packed a ton of information, both here in Acts and in the Gospel of Luke. Both of these books would have filled up entire scrolls all by themselves. Luke and Acts are comprised of more material than all of Paul's letters combined. Since Luke was a companion of Paul, it's clear that he actually was involved in writing a majority of the New Testament. So with that in mind, let's unpack these verses together. If you remember from our study of 1 Timothy, the purpose of Paul's letter to Timothy was to outline how the church was to be the pillar and the buttress of truth. We saw that in 1 Timothy 3.15. And here in the book of Acts, we find the purpose of Luke's writing in verse 8. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power, Jesus talking here, when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is Luke's thesis statement, or the purpose statement of his book. Christ has commanded his apostles to serve as his witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and beyond. So, as we begin our study in the book of Acts, it's our job to determine if Luke has achieved his objective or not. As we read through the book of Acts, we need to see if Christ's disciples are faithful to advance the gospel to the ends of the earth, or if instead... They decide to simply stay huddled together, worshiping God in the temple, and looking up to heaven every day, waiting to see if he's come back. So that being said, I don't want to spoil the book for anyone who hasn't read it yet, but I will contend that the fact that we're all gathered here together today tells me at least two of these guys followed their instructions. But we'll see what happens. Either way, this is the point of the book. This is the command that Christ has given to his apostles before ascending into heaven. Christ has commanded his followers to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and around the world. I can't even begin to imagine what this conversation was like. Well, what was this experience like with the risen Savior for these first followers of Christ? Can, can we just pause for a moment and think about and imagine what this conversation between Christ and his disciples might have been like? Sometimes I feel like we approach the Bible with a disconnected mindset. Too often we simply read these events that happen, and we read them like we're looking through the exhausted pages of a police report, just trying to see what happens, and we don't take the time to really reflect on the incredible events that have occurred. It reminds me of this video I saw online this week of the pillar of fire. You know, you read about the pillar of fire from the Old Testament and said, yeah, some people probably think it was like a little dust cloud, like this big. And then they create with AI what it probably looked like, just this pillar going all the way up to the sky, and you don't even see where it ends. It's just gigantic. The events that we read about in the Bible are massive. They're incredible. They're exciting events. They're mind-blowing. And here, it's the same thing. Christ is sharing his last words and his final instructions with his apostles. These are the last words they will ever hear from him. This is the last conversation they will have together on earth. After this conversation, Christ ascends up to heaven, and he disappears into the clouds. And no one has seen him since. No one. It's been 2,000 years since these events have taken place. And we're all still looking up into heaven, waiting with eager anticipation for Christ to return. So as a result, his disciples are curious. What's going to happen next? Look at verse 6 with me again. So when they come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom of Israel at this time? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. The disciples want to know, is this it? Is now the time when you're going to make everything right? Is now the time when you're going to rule and reign forever? To which Jesus basically responds, none of your business. It's none of your business. Don't worry about all that, Christ says. You don't need to worry about how all that's going to unfold. You don't need to worry about when it's going to happen. That's the Father's business. Your business, he tells them, is to advance the gospel as my witnesses throughout the world. It's like when you're on a road trip with your kids, right? They have 20 questions, and they're all the same question. Are we there yet? 
Are we close? How much longer? When are we going to get there? I'm tired. I'm hungry. What's going on? Aren't we there yet? This is the longest trip ever. And you just want to say, don't worry about it. Focus on your tablet and quit picking on your brother. (laughs) Forget about it. Jesus' disciples don't fully grasp what is happening here. They don't rightly understand what is, what is truly going on, which is understandable because I don't think either of us would either. They have a misguided view of Christ's mission. They thought the time had come for his kingdom to be established. They didn't realize everything that needed to take place before Christ's kingdom would be established here on earth. So as a result, they're focused on things they don't need to be focused on. And they're worried about things that they don't need to be worried about. It is really easy to distract ourselves with the things we'd rather focus on and think about less important things than to keep us from doing the actual thing that God has called us to give our time and our attention to. The mission that Christ has given his disciples is a serious mission. It had to feel daunting, impossible even. I'm sure a few of them heard this command from Christ and immediately shut down over the gravity of the mission that they had been given. By telling the disciples that they were to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and beyond, Jesus is showing them that his mission plan will not just cross through geographical barriers, but their task is to conquer cultural and ethnic barriers in the advancement of the gospel as well. So once again, we we read these words, and oftentimes the gravity of the situation is lost through the passage of time. These words from Christ had to shock his disciples. Jerusalem? That's where the Lord was crucified. Judea? They had already been rejected there. And Samaria? Samaria was looked down upon the same way that Rose Park or Magna are looked down upon today. It's true. Not to mention the ends of the earth. Statements like this meant the gospel was not just for Christians, but it was for the Jews. It was for the Gentiles. It was for everyone. When I look at our mission field today, I find myself struggling with similar fears of despair and frustration over the gravity surrounding our own situation. I can only imagine how overwhelming this commission from Christ had to be. Twelve guys. Eleven, because Judas went, hmm. Eleven guys against the world. Impossible. Not only were these guys outnumbered, but how can you share the gospel of Christ with others when the very one you're seeking to tell them about has disappeared into heaven? I can just picture how this conversation went. Hey, have you met Jesus? Well, no, I I haven't. Oh, well, well, would you like to? Sure. Where is he? Uh, So about that. He's not really here right now. Oh, so like he went to the store? That's okay, I can wait. Uh, We might be waiting a while. I can hear the voice from SpongeBob, the little narrator voice, 2,000 years later. In all seriousness, all joking aside, let's stop and really think about the weightiness and the burden that these apostles must have felt. After telling his disciples that he would, they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem and beyond, Jesus ascends into heaven and is gone. In an instant, the disciples found themselves alone. The, the shepherd and the teacher that had been leading them for over three years was gone. Jesus Christ, the Son of God who had defeated death in the grave but had rose again, was gone. He had risen, and for a moment, it was looking like he would restore Israel and everything in the world that they had been waiting for since the Old Testament and the time of the prophets would be fulfilled. Except he didn't. He didn't restore Israel. He didn't establish his throne here on earth, and he didn't destroy all the evil and the brokenness in our world. Instead, he imparted on his disciples a mission to share the gospel in bold and unheard of ways across cultural ethnic and geographical boundaries with a world that from all intents and purposes wanted nothing to do with Christ whatsoever. I can hear the collective gulp coming from the Christ's disciples. Gulp. Thankfully, though, the disciples were not alone. Not for long, at least. 
After all, Christ had promised them that someone else would come, that he would send a comforter, a helper to assist them with their mission. Remember, part of Christ's parting instructions was first to wait for the Holy Spirit to come before they went to share the gospel. Here in verse 4, we see a beautiful picture of the triune God displayed. Look at Acts 1-4 with me again. While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which he said, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in just a few days. Here, Jesus, God the Son, is reminding them of the promise that God the Father has given to them that God the Holy Spirit would come, that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit in less than a few days. This is our triune God. Three persons, one God, co-eternal, co-equal, each person 100% God. With that in mind, those of us who have read the rest of Acts know what Christ is referring to here. We know what the baptism of the Holy Spirit looks like. But there is no way that Christ's disciples knew what to expect. What was the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, how did it compare to John's baptism of water? Would they too hear a voice from heaven just like they did when Christ was baptized? Would they have supernatural powers like Christ did? Could Peter walk through walls like Christ did? Imagine the thoughts that had to be racing through their heads. None of them knew what to expect. How could they? If I had been there, I would have been asking the same questions as well. Some of my thoughts would have been, what's going to happen? How's this going to work? How long is a few days? When will we know that we've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What will it look like? What will it feel like? How does it even work? It won't be long before all their questions are answered. But before they can give it another thought, their minds are completely captured by something else. Christ's ascension into heaven. Verse 9 says, After he had said all this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took them out of their sight. When he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men, two angels, in white clothes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? The same Jesus who's been taken from you and into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. In a glimpse, in a moment, Christ is taken back up into heaven. Some of our early church fathers viewed this glorious exaltation of Christ's ascension back to heaven as the fulfillment of what the psalmist writes about in Psalm 24 that depicts Jesus and his entrance into heaven. Psalm 24, starting in verse 7, says, Lift up your, your heads, you gates. Rise up, ancient doors. Then the King of glory will come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, ancient doors. Then, then the King of glory will come in. Who is he? This King of glory, the Lord of armies. He is the king of glory. Before now, Jesus has appeared to his disciples in different intervals over the 40 days after his resurrection. We know from both the Gospels and from 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus actually appeared to more than 500 people since he rose from the dead. These people saw him, they touched him, they learned from him, and they knew that he had truly been resurrected from the dead. But now, after appearing multiple times across several days since his resurrection, Jesus has ascended back into heaven and has disappeared behind the clouds. In a moment, he was gone. When I first read about all this here in our text today, my original thought was that the disciples must have been terrified. How could they not be? They were alone and they had a daunting mission before them. Then I remembered the words that Luke wrote in the conclusion of his gospel. In Luke 24, starting in verse 52, it says, After worshiping him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple praising 
God. These guys weren't afraid. They had no reason to believe. Jesus is alive. They knew they weren't alone. Maybe they were afraid when he was in the grave, but he was alive now. He is risen and he's ascended into heaven only to return in glory one day. In the meantime, Jesus had promised to send them a helper. Not only that, but he had promised to never leave them and to never forsake them. There wasn't a collective gulp in their voice. Instead, there was a collective praise on their tongues. Just like the angels in heaven who rejoiced and worshipped him when Christ returned to heaven, the disciples are worshipping and praising God here on earth as they look on in amazement and wonder at all that has happened. There is a timeless principle that we need to grab a hold of today. The timeless principle I want you to see from our text today is that Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. We have no reason to fear because he's alive. He's ascended into heaven and will return one day. God's people will one day see Christ return in the same way that he was lifted up into heaven in Acts. Our God is alive. Christianity is not built on some man's speculation or on someone's wild imagination, but it's based on historical revelation. Jesus Christ was a real person. The book of Acts and the Bible itself is a real book about real people and real places that actually existed. You don't need a historical Buddha to have Buddhism, but you must have a historical Christ to have genuine Christianity. If Christ were dead, then Christianity itself is dead also. But he's not. He's alive, and as a result, the historical facts that we read about, the ones like here in Acts, serve as wonderful reminders and incredible faith builders for Christians today. Not only that, but these historical proofs also help serve in apologetic arguments for present-day Theophiluses or God-seekers as well. In fact, if you're seeking God this morning, this book is for you. If that's you, come talk to me. Let's study Acts together. Let's read the Gospel of Luke together. Come talk to me. Let me show you who Christ is and explain how he can rescue you the same way he's rescued me. In the meantime, for those of us who are already Christians, man, we got a job to do. Christ has commanded us to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. As a result, we can clearly see that God builds his church through the faithful witnesses of his people. Many view the book of Acts as the acts of the apostles, or, or the acts of the church, or the acts of God's people. But this book isn't so much about the apostles, or about the church, or about the people of God, as it is a book about God himself. The central theme of the book is about the Lord. This is a book about God. It's about Jesus. It's about the Holy Spirit. It's about our one and only triune God. To put it simply, the book of Acts is about Jesus Christ and his gospel message of redemption that is available throughout history for all who would receive it. The gospel message of Christ Jesus is often imitated, but it's never replicated. It's often counterfeited, but it's never duplicated. This is the genuine article, and nothing else in the world comes close to it. As Christians, we know that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, as revealed through Scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. The gospel message is simple, but those who carry this message, it will cost you everything. This uncomfortable truth doesn't just apply to Christ's first century apostles, but to modern day followers of Christ as well. In these few verses from the book of Acts, we can clearly see that the gospel of Christ continues in the life of his followers today. Before Jesus leaves and prior to the Holy Spirit coming, Jesus gives his apostles their marching orders. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Their mission, should they choose to accept it, is to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. Our mission today, should we choose to accept it, is to preach the gospel to all the earth. That being said, 
in order to advance the gospel and achieve the mission that Christ has given to us, we must be faithful. We must be faithful, dependent, and passionate in our gospel witness. The eyewitnesses and acts have achieved the gospel message of Jesus Christ. They've advanced it to ear witnesses who are alive today. One of the greatest gifts that we'll see from the Pentecost event that's going to come in chapter 2, that Christ has foreshadowed here in chapter 1, is that all believers can now speak for God. You don't need a special blessing or specific assignment from the church in order to share the gospel. Because as Christians, each one of us has been commissioned by Christ himself to proclaim the gospel everywhere we go, even unto the ends of the earth. The only difference between us gathered together here today and the missionary out in a foreign country somewhere is our zip code. What's the only difference? The only difference is our location. Every Christian is a missionary. Every one of us has been tasked with this assignment. Share the gospel. The reason our mission here at Redeeming Life is to know, live, and proclaim the gospel is because that's the very mission that Christ gave the church here in Acts 1.8. We exist to be witnesses of Christ Jesus and to share with others not the, only the incredible miracles that he's performed in our own lives, but the amazing things that Christ has done throughout history. Once again, the gospel message of Jesus Christ is simple, but the demand on his messengers is serious. If you choose to follow Christ, you're going to experience pain and suffering in this life. Throughout the gospels, Jesus told his disciples that they would suffer. Look at Luke 21 or John 15. And in the book of Acts, we see that Christ's disciples did in fact suffer. Crossing cultural barriers and boldly proclaiming the gospel in the face of opposition requires sacrifice. If you were with us for our series in January, When the Gospel Goes, you might remember the persecution that Paul and the other missionaries experienced. It started with floggings and it ends in martyrdom. This theme of suffering continues throughout the entire book of Acts, and it continues even on in our world today, as the enemy wages war against the church and against the truth of the gospel. From the beginning of Acts, throughout church history, and even today, we see that as the gospel advances, there's persecution and suffering that goes along with it. Quite often, followers of Christ must suffer or even die in their efforts to advance the gospel and lead those who are lost to finding true life in Christ. I know that's not the most encouraging recruitment message. I get it. But it is the most accurate. On the plus side, with much sacrifice comes great reward. The question is, even in the face of opposition, despite incredible persecution, will you be faithful to share the gospel and proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. In addition to being faithful to proclaim the gospel, we must be dependent on God as well. The apostles of Christ Jesus were not alone in their mission. And we're not alone in our mission either. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, the disciples were given the essential power required to serve as witnesses of Christ Jesus. The same Holy Spirit that was alive in them is active and living in the hearts and minds of every believer today empowering us and equipping us to advance the mission of God. One Bible scholar I read put it this way. Ordinary people of God, equipped with the Word of God and empowered by the Spirit of God, dedicated to the Son of God, can accomplish the mission of God. Sharing the message of Christ is only part of the equation. We must also be filled with and dependent upon the Spirit of God to be effective in our gospel witness. When I was in the grocery business, I, I could just work harder to get things done. The longest shift I ever worked was 23 hours. I tried to make it to 24, but I couldn't really see straight, and my coworkers were saying I was starting to smell. <laughs> but corporate was coming, and the store had to look good, so I just rolled up my sleeves and worked harder. That doesn't work in the life of a preacher. If I stand behind the sacred desk, under my own power, aside from the Holy Spirit, nothing I say or do will have any effect whatsoever. I have to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We have to be empowered by the Holy Spirit in order to advance the gospel. We can't be effective in our gospel proclamation unless we are truly dependent on the Holy Spirit 
for strength, wisdom, and the boldness necessary to proclaim the gospel. Lastly, we must be a people who are passionate about the gospel. A zeal for the kingdom only exists when we have a passion for the king. I love pizza. You guys hear me talk about it in almost every sermon. I, I love Monopoly. I have almost over 30 versions of the game. I know, you're welcome. Come play with me. Think about the things you love. Think about the things you're passionate about, your favorite sports teams, your favorite restaurants. There are people in this church who know more about sports than I ever thought was possible. I know that because they're passionate about it. When you're passionate about something, it's not hard to talk about. If we're passionate about the gospel, it won't be hard to talk about the gospel with our friends, our neighbors, or even strangers on the street. On the flip side, little love for the king produces little zeal for the kingdom's gospel mission. As a result, we must pray for spirit-empowered faithfulness in our lives. We must pray for an utter dependence and reliance on God and his Holy Spirit. We must pray and ask God to equip us with a love and a passion for the gospel like never before. We must also pray that God would use us to reach the lost, to proclaim the message of salvation to the broken world that's around us. As followers of Christ, God uses faithful witnesses to build his church and advance the gospel around the world. Church, the charge from God's word this morning is crystal clear. Our mission from Christ is to proclaim the gospel here in Bountiful, in Farmington, in Rose Park, in Glendale, and beyond, even unto the ends of the earth. Church, our mission is possible, and our mission starts now. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much, Lord, for the Holy Spirit that makes it possible to be filled with boldness and courage to, to cross barriers that we would normally not even look across, from as simple as walking across our street to, to driving to a different town to, to getting on a plane and going to a foreign country. Lord, I pray that as Christians, as followers of Christ, we would be faithful to do what you've called us to do. We wouldn't worry about the things we're not supposed to worry about. We wouldn't have fear over the things we're not supposed to be afraid of. But that we would simply do what you've called us to do. And that's to be your witnesses. Both here in Bountiful, in Rose Park, in Farmington, in Centerville, and beyond, Lord Jesus. So that we could rescue others who are hurt, who are suffering, who are lost. Just like someone else helped us and pointed us to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.